Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Walker. How are you? Good. Mark, has it just been a week? Because it feels like it's been longer than a week. Because I've got all of these games that I played, all of this news. It just feels as though more than a week has gone by. It's been a good week, although admittedly, every moment with you feels like an eternity. Uh, that's what everyone in my life says. Maybe I should reconsider my life values. That being said... This is a podcast about board games. We're going to talk about the games we played this week, the news, and why it doesn't matter, and the feature game of the week, which is Imperial Struggle. Take your day quill now. So, Mark, (laughs) what did you play this week? Got to play an excellent game of SEAL Team Flex, the only game that matters. This was as enjoyable as ever. We were able to exercise the unique geography of the board to ex- execute a brilliant flanking maneuver. We showed up in the entry, entry room. We made a whole lot of noise. Uh, many of this, much of this noise was caused by Dewey causing a disc to, I mean, technically proceed along the board, but certainly not far enough to say hit anything. So we laughed at him and then we got out of the room very quickly. <laughs> and then well, I heard this was all a ploy by Dewey to make the bad guys look as though that he was a bumbling fool and then you know, cranked up the machine gun and and knocked them all down. Truly, it was a work of performance art in that case. And we were then able to, you know, proceed along one end of the corridor, and all the patrols went through the other side of the corridor, and we executed a brilliant flanking maneuver, and then almost all of us died. But we still won, which is great. And I am very much looking forward to the semi-sequel. So Pete Ruth and Mark Thomas, who made Seal Team Flicks, are going to be coming out with a game called Phantom Division, which is also going to be a co-op dexterity flicking game with some strategic elements, this time by our friends at Elzra on Neoprene Mats. I am very curious about how this is going to work, because again, a lot of my enthusiasm about Seal Team Flicks is about the boards and how the unique geography of the rooms interact with the excellent enemy AI and and utilizing that terrain to your advantage. But I am assured that everything is going to be great and that Phantom Division will be the greatest thing ever made. I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. How could it not be? At any rate, so... That's also true. Mark, I played a game that I've talked about a lot. Everyone seems to want to pronounce it different. T.O. to... Wait, I got it this time. It's tedium to walking up the tracks. Have you have you turned? Has your relationship to Tia Talk and soured? It has, Mark. I oh, think no. It's it's on Board Game Arena. I've been playing it a lot. I think I'm going to just stop until they incorporate some of the expansions. It just seems, it seems like it's tracks on tracks. And How many digital implementations have ruined your enthusiasm for games, Walker? Quite a few. Actually, oh, that's I'm too afraid. bad. It's and it's mostly just like when new players come on, they 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 look at the the, the temple and they say, "Boy, this will be let's build the temple and have fun," and then. And then the tracks happen, and <laughs> yes, but this is Teotihuacan is a game by NSK Games, designed by Daniele Tizzini, and it's a great. We already talked about Rondell Games last week. It's a great sort of Rondell game where you have multiple workers, and not only that, they're dice workers, which I love. So they get better as they go around the board, and they they expire or retire or. Or get offered up to the gods when they become too old, however you want to look at it. I have a terrible suggestion. Instead of dice, why don't we make them all miniatures like in Lords of Hellas, and every time they tick up, you get another piece. Oh, that would be cool. That would only triple the playing time for say, no that, benefit. For no no benefit whatsoever. I'm just going to dovetail this into, this is okay that the game has served for me, because this week on Board Game Arena, Yokohama came out. So I just sort of just fell into that. And even though I played several games of that, it is not getting tired tiresome it is yet another type of many workers the more workers you have the better the action is it's you know a little bit like teo to walk in that way on your turn you're either putting out three workers in different places or two workers in the same place yokohama is by hasashi yahashi and it's put out by tmg games and i would check it out if you have someone that you know that has it Go check it out. It's one of these things where you're uh, completing orders and you have all these different victory conditions and you're trying to accumulate all these points. Has some very interesting mechanisms. That's Yokohama. I tried Sprawlopolis. Sprawlopolis is one of those minimalistic games that consists entirely of 18 cards. That is it. It's not one of those 18-card games where it's a dice game like Under Falling Skies, which is a brilliant game. Or even Tiny Forming Mars, which is, oh, it's only a small number of cards and a whole bunch of cubes and some other tokens besides. This is just 18 cards. And I have to say that in terms of the mileage that it gets out of those 18 cards, it's spectacularly impressive. The amount of design work 
that you get, the amount of gameplay you get out of those 18 cards is truly remarkable. It's nominally a city building game. On one side of each of the 18 cards is a scoring condition. And you pick three of those, and the remaining 15 cards are then flipped over, and each of them, you they just have four districts and some road combination of roads. And the gameplay is remarkably freeform as well, in that you it's kind of like a tile-laying game, but you can put the city districts wherever you like. You can bury other districts, play on top of each other, leave holes in the middle of the city. The only thing you can't do is rotate your cards 90 degrees. So they all have to be the same orientation. You can flip them 180 degrees, but you can't rotate them 90 degrees. And you can't tuck cards underneath. Other than that, you can pretty much do it however you like, so long as it connects up to the initial city. And it was one of those games that really highlights how games can make you feel stupid. We talked about this in the context of Barrage. Barrage makes me feel dumb. Barrage makes a lot of people feel dumb. Sprawlopolis makes me feel super dumb because it's a spatial puzzle, mostly. It's a pure co-op. Your goal is to get a city that meets or, meets or exceeds the scoring conditions of the three cards you revealed as scoring conditions. So, for example, one scoring condition card might shower you with points, but it increases the threshold considerably. Or you might get a setup like the one we had, whereby most of the cards were bad and most of the cards were painful, and the threshold was relatively low. So, all in all, I'm impressed with the design work of Sprawlopolis, but number one, it's not really for me, because it's mostly a spatial puzzle, and number two, in terms of it being a co-op, it really lends itself into sort of decision-making by committee. I am not the kind of person who typically has problems with the, the so-called sock puppet or alpha gamer problem. I usually find that, especially with the people we play with, it's fine. But the way Sprawlopolis works, everything is so incremental, and every placement is usually a question of, well, I'll gain a point here, but we'll lose two points from the scoring, uh, this other scoring condition, what have you, and it's not the kind of thing that I personally or the other two people at the table could visually intuit on the face of it. So we would frequently be in positions where it's like, okay, well, I'll play this card. Oh, it doesn't fit there. And the moment you've shown a card, that's the card you're playing. But once you've shown a card, everyone can pitch in and contribute and suggest where it goes. And so it naturally led to that kind of group discussion, which is fine. I don't object to it. But it ends up just fe feeling like a collective spatial puzzle. Now, the solo game, it, therefore, loses practically nothing. As a result, you know, the, the group in, in that insofar as the group dynamics are unsatisfying, the solo dynamics are just fine. So I'm very impressed with Sprawlopolis in a lot of ways. I'm not sure uh, there's much more for me to enjoy there, though. I'll probably play it another couple times. The rules overhead is remarkably low. Again, just the ability to play wherever you like is, is remarkably good. And it's sufficiently impressive that I enjoy showing it to people. It's like this is how much you get out of 18 cards. And so I don't know how much legs it's going to have, and I, I kind of enjoyed my, my first play of it, and I don't know how much more I'll get out of it, but I have to say, I am impressed by Sprawlopolis and future design work of the people involved. It was designed by a three-person team, Stephen Armini, Danny Devine, and Paul Klucka over at Buttonshy. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to their future output, because this is some impressive work. So you and I, you and I got to play a uh, Blood Rage variant, like if uh, Vikings aren't your thing, you'd rather do it in South America... Uh, we played Mezzo, which is, I felt, almost, I don't want to say identical to Blood Rage, but it had that very strong Blood Rage feel. I think it's exactly like Mage Knight in that it has miniatures and cards, don't. and therefore, and tokens too, and no, so it's no, no, just no. like Mage Knight. It has a rondel play system because you play in a rondel type arrangement. Come on. And round one follows round two in a circle, so it's a, a rondel. It has all your units that are complete. There's no complete. drafting. There's, there's, oh, what? there's, oh, sorry, sorry. You're there's right. zero it drafting. It doesn't have that one mechanism. You're right. Oh, yeah. Drafting is entirely incidental to Blood Rage. It also doesn't have any of the tempo considerations of Blood Rage. It also doesn't have any of the spatial considerations of Blood Rage. It has exactly the same. It has a map. It has that, a map. There you go. Just, you, like, just you, like Mage Knight. And you go through each territory. Every territory has its own special ability that you're fighting over. All your units are completely expendable. Your leaders give you extra strength. You have giant god figures that go around and give you special abilities. Just like the monsters in Blood Rage. Yeah, so there are special abilities. So special abilities in fighting. So far, that's the only legitimate overlap that I think we've got here. Expendable troops. Powerful As leaders. opposed to any other. <laughs> anyway, gave me shamans. Gave me the very uh, a very Blood Rage feel. I'm sorry that I had a Blood Rage feel and you didn't. 
I no, look, I, I'm sorry that I think you're 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 actually focusing on the wrong areas for how it is similar. It is similar, I think, in a way that a lot of the other what I what I've been kind of informally calling the weird troops on a map games, insofar as it has some of the a lot of the same visual touchstones and even some of the same kind of overall objectives. You want to win this territory, whatever winning a territory looks like. But at the same time, it subverts a lot of the traditional conventions of a game like Risk or even a game like Comet, because Comet is far far more similar to a lot of the other troops on a map conventions than something like Blood Rage or Rising Sun or Mezzo or even sometimes things like Tsukuyumi, but that's another thing entirely. Although it is still in the same wheelhouse, broadly speaking, as Blood Rage, I think it's in that wheelhouse with a lot of other games. And the fact that everything proceeds on a schedule, uh, the regions proceed in, in, in a strict order, which completely subverts a lot of the timing elements of Blood Rage. The action selection element is quite cute. That's the thing I like most about Mezzo. In Mezzo, whenever a fight happens in the region, everybody picks from three cards, and the cards give you a menu of actions to do, much like Tsukuyumi does. And that, that fundamental action selection mechanism I find very novel, and the fact that every character built in from the start has an entirely different deck of cards to drive that action makes things rather neat. And you're juggling a bunch of different resources, but none of the resources you're juggling have much to do with the actual deployment of troops. Troops come free. The fact that they're expendable isn't really the issue. It's more that they come out for free automatically. And so, unlike even in Blood Rage, where you have to pay Rage, or you have to pay Rage to move them, or things like that, in Mezzo, it's more about managing your available supply. So it's less about throughput and more about overall supply. True, and it's a game where you have to really roll the punches. You can't really plan on taking a territory or, you know, have any... I don't want to call this coming out negative, right? It's not as though you, you just have to roll with the punches constantly. It feels a little bit like take that sometimes. Yes. There are effects that are very pointed and very aggressive and undermine and can undermine what you thought were your strategic plans. I've heard Mezzo described as almost purely tactical, and I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not by much. It is very tactical, not very strategic. Did you enjoy it? I did. No, I definitely played it again. It was very interesting. The, the miniatures were great. I love the timing. Like you said, when you flip, it's uh, not so much of a set order that the that the area is resolved in as opposed to the it's a deck of territories and they're shuffled. And once it's it's there, it, it's it's in stone. So you sort of have to, you can sort of plan ahead. It's like, okay, well, this one's already triggered or you really hope that a particular one triggers first so you can move your god somewhere else. Or it, It's very interesting that way. That is the element of strategic planning that I think is present that prevents Mezzo from being purely tactical. I enjoy Mezzo as well. I really enjoyed our recent playing. I'd commented before, Mezzo was one of the last games I got before the quarantine hit. In fact, I think it was the, the game that I last played at the public game night before we played uh, Mega Civ for my birthday. And so in, in my head, those are the last two games of the before times. And you'd been wanting to play Mezzo for a while. And we played a three-player game with setup and rules explanation in about 90 minutes, which is by far the fastest I'd, I'd ever played. My previous games with, with three players were at least two hours. My games with four players were two and a half hours, bordering on three. And while the game was engaging during that entire time, I felt that that was far too long. And I was very gratified that when we played, it was only about 90 minutes, because I think that's a much better time frame for a game of its elk. I don't think the decision making or the things that happen are quite sufficient to, to bear that. Yeah, no, yeah, it, it like. clipped along very well. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And that was Mezzo. John Claudis, put out by Colossal Games and Portal Games. We also get to play more sessions of The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. We were just approaching it like a filler, which it very much is because the early missions in the, in the crew are incredibly quick, can last even just a single trick long. Despite that, it's very, very simple to just reshuffle the deck and, and go and proceed along and do the next one. I defended the crew when we first played it. You talked about how you felt it was... Uh, a little underwhelming and kind of derivative, and you didn't really see the appeal. Uh, look, I can I can play the tape. I have I have records. I there. said nothing of the kind. You absolutely did. You did I not understand it was... why it was being nominated for awards. You thought that it didn't really bring anything new to the table because you said that co op trick taking. Well, ah, I said don't try to gaslight I said, me. I said it was a game filler, and and it was a, it's a great game a filler game. It's nothing wrong with it. It's a great game. It's just not like game of the year material. Ah. <sighs> This is, you're completely moving the goalposts here. This is ridiculous. Anyway, it was the first time we, at least the first time I played it in real life. Me too. All the other, all, the, all of our other sessions were uh, virtual. So, and it gave me that feel exactly what I wanted, you know, sitting around, figuring it out, 
thought it was great. I liked the look on like the one the one new player that we were teaching. He was uh, aware of how trick taking games worked, and as soon as he heard that it was co op and saw how the game played. I got that click, you know, that I love seeing in people's faces where you just realize they're going to have a ton of fun. And, uh, yeah, that was the crew. Thomas Singh put out by Cosmos. I, if you enjoy any trick taking games, I would definitely give this a whirl. I got to play a couple of roll and writes. First one was Quicks by Stefan Brenorf put out by Game Right. This is just a straight up, you know, you roll the dice and the active player rolls six dice and two of them are white. They put those aside. They announce the, the total and everyone can use that number. And then they take, they take one of the whites and one of the other colors and they can combine those and, and use that number. And you have four different colored dice. Two of them start from 12 and go to two and two of them start at two and go to 12. And you're just crossing off numbers. And as soon as you put an X on your chart, then you can't go back any more left and you're just trying to flow along. You see, yeah. So on a 12 to two track, if I take a nine, I've effectively precluded the ability to ever claim a 10, 11, 12. Exactly. And I think the strategy of the game here is try to utilize those white dice as many times as possible and, and not give up any dice you know because if you if the active player passes on the white ones and the and the color dice then they have to click a box and they lose five points in the game if a person does that four times that triggers the end of the game and then there's the end of the numbers right so two twelves and two twos if someone uh gets the final numbers on their rows as long as they have five other x's and they cancel out that row and we take that die out as soon as any two colors are locked and that also triggers the end of the game but not only that, it gives you another X. You get to X out the lock, which is the scoring mechanisms. You count all your, you know, X'd out boxes, and then you consult the chart, add up your points. I thought it was, we played it today, loved it. Nice and quick, loved how it worked. And the second one was, that's pretty clever. It won a whole bunch of awards. I only played it solo. This works slightly different, where the active player gets to rule th- effectively three times. It might not be three times, because... When they choose a die, any of the dice that are lower gets put up on a silver tray. And then if they have dice left over, they get to roll those again and then pick one and the lower ones go away and then roll a third time. So you could only roll once and you take a six and all the other dice disappear, so on and so forth. They have all sorts of different ways you're crossing off boxes and different areas. It's a little more complicated than quicks, but for a roll and write, I think it's still fairly generalized and I'm looking forward to playing it with multiple players. I'd give it a try. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that I've never tried any of the clever games, partially because, I mean, they just seem a little too self-satisfied. Yawn. We played Colorado by Michael Schacht, the venerable filler, which I have to say, it's pretty much the opposite for me of Sprawlopolis. You know, I look at Sprawlopolis and I say, this is amazing design work, but then I don't really get a whole lot out of it. Colorado is one of those games that I keep forgetting how much I like. You know, I, someone suggests Colorado, I'm like, eh, there are other fillers I prefer. And it's true, there are other fillers I prefer. For Sale, for me, is probably my my favorite filler, partially because I just prefer auctions. But the amount of tension and angst and agony, and group tension and group agony, and the trash talk and the schadenfreude in Colorado is really delicious, which also reminds me of Raw, which, again, brilliant auction game. Just the the joy of collectively watching someone pull things from a bag or a deck that somehow the Quacks of Quedlingburg doesn't capture for us, in part because it just takes so long and you have to see, see it done in cereal. But in Colorado, the simple act of pulling a chameleon from a deck and watching it be brown, and everyone moans because they know that brown is terrible for whomever, or awesome for the person downstream... It's a joy. It's a lovely little social experience. And Michael Schacht is really, really good at designing these incredibly abstract, very simple, very social games. So he, he designed Web of Power, for example, which is going to be uh, Iwari, which we will eventually get. And again, very, very simple set of rules, very, very abstract, but nonetheless, the quality of person-to-person interaction that you get over the course of the game, even when it's not high-quality player interaction, it's high-quality social interaction out of a simple rule set. And that, I think, is one of the hallmarks of a Shack design. And Colorado is, is absolutely an instance of this. I only play Colorado once every few years, and I never want to recommend it, but every time it happens, I'm reminded of how pleasant it is. And so maybe I should spend a little bit more of an effort to suggest Colorado at more occasions. Yeah, it's pretty well the only reason I, I brought it up because it's, I don't want to say it's difficult to get, but for whatever reason in our area, everyone keeps talking about it and wanting a copy, but no one has one to pass around or whatever. So I just said, okay, finally it came into stock. So I grabbed one. So now I can, now I can pass it around. You're a good man, Walker. 
Orleans. I love Orleans. There's an expansion for Orleans called Orleans Invasion. And if you have Orleans, I would suggest that this would be the first expansion that you get because it has a fantastic cooperative version. But for what I played, it also has two solo missions in the, in the box as well, as well as all sorts of other stuff. But anyway, I'm just going to talk about the solo. It was very interesting and you had to go around and what this one did, Mark, was it put all the citizens around on the board and I think it was seven, told you seven places to put them on the board and said, then you can put whatever you have left anywhere in their normal spots. And then you had, and then had a sheet of set events. So you went through these events and you tried to move around Orleans, collect all the citizens and the other way too. And it was, it was fairly hard and I had a lot of fun playing it. I'm going to try it again, I think. Have there been other big box expansions or is Invasion the only one? Because I know there's tw- there, there 25 was... different promo tiles that you've been assiduously searching yeah, out. I know it was. I've gotten all the promo tiles. There is one other boxed one. It's the the intrigue one that has you know the there's the other board where you retire all your guys. Oh, I see. It has a new board that is really backstabby. I where, see. Where you where you place board. I didn't it has know some that. other stuff. Yeah, it's pretty. Interesting. I've never tried it yet. I've always wanted to. And that is Orleans Invasion. That's put out by Tasty Minstrel Games and the. I think Reiner Stockhausen, Stockhausen. did, did uh, Orleans, and the people that worked on the expansion are Inca Brand and Marcus Brand. So, Walker, I used to like Scythe. In fact, I've gotten a lot of heat for my enthusiasm for Scythe. I think it's a good, not great game, and I've enjoyed it. I don't know that I like Scythe anymore because you made me play the digital version. I didn't make you do anything, Mark. You forced me. You can blame Huey for this. No, this is Louis' fault. Louis' fault. Sorry. Louis suggested it. Huey was uh, was brought on board. I found playing the digital version incredibly, incredibly painful. I was shocked because the clock there there is a clock that tracks how long everyone is taking for their turns and it includes all the ridiculously time wasting animations of oh this worker's moving to another hex let's tip him over and send him in this large arc and then send it over to this other hex oh there's your move it's like ah kill me now but. At the end of the game, I was shocked to discover that after a four-player game, it had only taken 90 minutes. Now, that is excluding the 20 minutes before that it takes for everyone to figure out how the online architecture works and for everyone to register at asmoday.net and what have you and confirm your blah, 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 blah. But the reason why I came to the conclusion that it felt like an eternity is because it doesn't have the very salutary recommendation that the Scythe rulebook has, which is after you've done your top action tell the next player to go. And that just has a tremendously positive effect on the overall playing experience. Once you've done the part where player interaction is 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 done, because the bottom row actions only affect other people in terms of recruits, just let the game move on. Let people fiddle with their own player mat at their own pace and, and fiddle with the resources and like, oh, I, I need the two metal from here and the metal from over here. If you make everyone wait for everyone to do that, it's not going to make the game last longer. It's just going to make the f- game feel like it lasts longer. And I don't think I'll ever play the side of the digital edition ever again. I can only agree with you. But in that, Mark, this is why you have multiple monitors. You see, you have Yokohama <laughs> going on <laughs> over on this monitor while you're waiting for slow people in Scythe playing on this monitor. Oh, wow. And the one thing I'm going to talk about Digital Scythe is, is it has a, like a leaderboard where it will tell you everyone's score completely up to date where everybody is at a, at a given time. And I am well aware that there are some players who do this quickly in their heads while the game is going on. They know exactly how many points everyone has. And there are other players that at tedium take a long time and say, wait, wait, wait. And they'll go around and add up not only one person's score, but everyone's score just to check to see where everybody is. Which is acceptable in the last round of the game. It is not acceptable at other times. At least by our standards. True. And I just, I, for whatever reason, just bothers me in Scythe. I don't, I like, yeah. I like Scythe where, you know, you're looking around the table and you think, oh, that guy seems to be doing well, or I seem to be doing just as well as everybody else. I don't like clicking on the, on the leaderboard and seeing exactly where everybody is. That's a pet peeve, I guess. For, not for my part, I remembered that that feature existed, but I couldn't remember exactly where to get it. I don't think the interface is particularly good. That's another beef I have with the Scythe Digital Edition. But we've, we've, talked about issues surrounding this a number of times in our topics. This is about a preference between a more intuitive versus a more calculational style of play. And some games lend themselves to more intuitive versus more calculational styles of play. And sometimes games are at, are fail because they give you the information for an intuitive style of play, but they demand a calculational style of play. And this mismatch of expectations can be a problem. For example, I could easily imagine 
many groups thriving under a condition where the score is publicly visible at all times because they demand to know this kind of data at all times. I'm thinking of a kind of mindset exhibited by Dr. Hansom on occasion. And if you're in a world surrounded by Dr. Hansom, first of all, good luck concentrating on the game because you'll always be distracted. <laughs> but number two, that's great. That's wonderful for you. It's related to the issue of hidden trackable information. Designers put in hidden trackable information so as to encourage a more intuitive style of play. And Scyther doesn't have hidden trackable information. It instead has openly calculable but somewhat opaque information because you have to do the calculation of someone's popularity level and all their hexes they control, etc., etc. And I, like you, prefer a more intuitive style of play. And the fact that the digital version allows for a more calculational style that doesn't bother me, but I can see why its presence would would undermine your enjoyment of the experience because it, you know it, it takes away that trash talk and that sort of sympathy talk where you're like oh i hate that part where, of it. Well, the whining not, not, not so much whining as as if you stay in your own little corner or why like, are you oh, taking my territory yeah, why, why, they're winning you, how about you just go do do your thing over there i'll do my thing over here you, you know you sound as though you're not and all the person has to do is click on it and say oh you're you're twice my score well that's not going to happen and you know they crushify you but anyway on a quick note uh that's a uh Scythe is a Stonemaier game, and apparently uh, Viticulture has now its own digital implementation, and it will be out on Steam soon as well. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. I'm just going to talk quickly about a couple computer glitches that happened this week. First one is Distributor put out put up the expansion for Twilight Imperium 3, Prophecy of Kings. So, before the Tw- Fantasy Flight even announced it twilight oh, imperium 3? sorry twilight imperium 4 sorry i just put that in sorry they apparently put, this was a very bad glitch yeah very bad glitch it went back in time no sorry sorry ti4 twilight imperium 4 it's called prophecy of the kings it's going to bring it up to eight players right because you gotta oh, have wow. you gotta have eight players in twilight imperium uh a whole bunch more tiles uh mechs and you know the all the other stuff from the other expansions like it's probably instead of tanks it's mechs but you know it's going to have all this other stuff like it had in the other expansions the only thing that caught my eye was the fact that it's going to be $99. It said MSRP, $99. That is many dollars. The other one may or may not have been a computer glitch. Uh, Pandemic Legacy, someone brought it came up on a search on their website. And I don't know, maybe they quickly just put out a press release because it was they were found out. But anyway, long story short, Pandemic Legacy Zero will be out soon. It'll be a legacy game done in the past. And... We love the first one. Second one was kind of dull. Hopefully this third. They say now it's a it's a trilogy, so this will be the last one? Or is it the kind of trilogy where there's one, two, and three, and zero as well? Because zero can mess with the name of That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the prequel. On the topic of expansions, Undaunted North Africa is going to be hitting the shelves soonish, and we'll be getting our copy to speak about it as soon as we can, because we're a big fan of the first game in the series, Undaunted Normandy. But there's also going to be an expansion. In the, in the classic tradition of a new standalone base set having new features. They're not going to have an expansion to backport some of the features into the base game. And so Undaunted Reinforcements is predicted to be released next August, which is to say August 2021. And this is going to be by Trevor Benjamin and and David Thompson, the designers of Undaunted Normandy in North Africa. But it's also going to have a solo mode by David Zorze. And if passes any prologue, it will be a solo mode with several pages of rules unto itself and not a particularly smooth experience, and I won't want to try it. But who knows? Yeah. I, I like David Sorte's designs generally, but a lot of his solo stuff strikes me as overwrought. I'm just keen to always see if there are new features that are cool bringing them into the base game, because although Undaunted Normandy is a super tight design and very, very compelling, if we really like the features in Undaunted North Africa, it'll be great not to have to choose between the two systems. True. It looks a little bit- from what I read, it had modules for both. It's like, we have this, this, and this for yes, that too. Normandy, and this, this, and this for North Africa. It also is going to have a four-player mode, which might be interesting. We'll see. There was something called DeepMind that they programmed to play at Go, and now they're going to program it to play Diplomacy. I'm surprisingly interested to see how this turns out, because for a long time, programming an AI for Go was difficult to impossible. And DeepMind's AlphaGo project was very, very successful. And now they're turning their minds to diplomacy. They want to make a, an AI that can negotiate and cooperate rather than just play in a zero-sum game. Well, as long as as long as long they keep the, the who's who secret, 
and P players don't figure out that this one particular player is the computer player, <laughs> which they will just naturally team up on because, <laughs> because they don't want the computers to take over the world. And that's that's what's going to happen. And all we need to do then is marry the DeepMind diplomacy AI to a chatbot that can reliably pass the Turing test. And <laughs> there we go. So we love Reiner Knizia. I I would be his weakest game that I think I've played is Lord of the Rings. Really? You've never played a Knizia you, you liked less than Lord of the Rings? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Maybe you can bring huh. one to my memory. Well, because well, he's, designed, he's designed a fair number of games that I think don't really work or are not particularly good. I mean, he, he's still my favorite hey, I'm, game I'm designer. Sure he, I'm sure he has. Is that I just haven't played them. Maybe, well, most, or, recently, or, the, most recently, the one that comes to mind is Llama. I suppose. Well, I meant like in... in uh, a bigger game genre, so like in a, oh, like sure. a full game. Anyway, long story short, I don't know who's asking for this. Maybe there's some a, a lot of people out there that really liked it. I just was not one of them. Uh, we played it a little bit when it first came out. Then the person that bought it sort of left town and left it with me, and it stood on my shelf. No one played it. No one wanted to play it. I knew the rules. I often suggested it just because it was there. But anyway, there's oh. going to be a new anniversary edition. A lot of people like Lord of the Rings, both the game and the general environment. I could never tell if I couldn't get into it because of the mechanisms or the fact that I despise the Lord of the Rings. Me learning how to play the Lord of the Rings was uh, a great cogn- exercise in cognitive dissonance to, to discover whether I liked Reiner Knizia more than I hated Lord of the Rings. And I eventually came down on the side that I hated Lord of the Rings more. Bit of news about Steven Universe, and any news about Steven Universe is vastly more important than any news about anything other than Steven Universe. The Cryptozoic game by Erica Bioris, the Beachapalooza card battling game, was originally supposed to be released, but it was delayed for a variety of reasons. It's going to now be a Kickstarter exclusive, and it's going to go up on Kickstarter on July the 14th, and I'm going to give them however much money they want, because Steven Universe is the greatest thing ever. There you go, Steven Universe by Cryptozoic. Stone Meyer is putting out a game by first called Pendulum by first time game designer Travis P. Jones. End yeah. of story. Yeah. Lost Runes of Arnick. I bring it up only because CGE is putting it out. And CGE, I find, just puts out quality, fantastic games. So there's not much on it about it that I could find or anything that stood out in particular other than the fact that the publisher it usually puts out quality stuff. And then lastly for me, there's going to be a documentary about board gaming coming out. Apparently it says it's supposed to be uh, released July the 7th, which is from this recording this, which is tomorrow, called Game Master. From what the, the brief little trailers that I watch, it seems like it'll be quite interesting. It takes shows you how, you know, games start from design to, you know, being fully published. So maybe you'll have some information. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Sounds like a, a, a brief documentary, because my understanding is that what happens is you scroll out a design, you get some 3D renders, and then you put it on Kickstarter, and there you go. And then you're done. Yeah. Kickstarter takes care of the rest. That's that's what development is called, right? I, that's what I've yeah. heard. Yeah. And that is the news, and why it doesn't matter. Now, on to the feature game, which is Imperial Struggle. Imperial Struggle was put out by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews at GMT this year. I should note that this was a review copy supplied to us by GMT. And the design pedigree is as follows. It started with Twilight Struggle in 2005, uh, and then uh, the sequel to that was Twilight Imperium, and then that was followed up by Imperial Assault, and then after that is Imperial Struggle, and after that they're going to release Struggle of Empires. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, it's it's a very, very long, impressive pedigree and covers a lot of different genres. These two guys get around. Man, they, they get it done. Yeah. In all seriousness, Twilight Struggle came out in 2005, and was probably one of the biggest hits that GMT has ever had. It was number one on Board Game Geek for some time. It is the two-player card-driven game about the Cold War between the Soviets and the Americans. And it was one of those big crossover hits. It was one of those things a lot of Eurogamers finally tried something by GMT, other than, say, Battle Line, which was obviously another bit of an exception. And it has been in many, 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 many print runs, I had one of the original print runs, which had, you know, the, the cardboard map, and instead of Chile, it said Chile, and it had a whole bunch of other typos and, and a whole bunch of mistakes, you know. But I, like the dutiful and completionist obsessions that I am, bought, I think, pretty much every printing of Twilight Struggle up until their deluxe version, which is what they have now. Anyway, for years, 
Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews have been talking about their follow-up called Imperial Struggle, which is a two-player game about the imperial machinations between the English and the French in largely speaking the 18th century, between 1697 and 1789, uh, ending with the French Revolution, obviously. And Obviously. Yes. Everyone knows the French Revolution started in 1789. <laughs> it's simple, 789. It's a very easy date to remember. Anyway, Ananda Gupta hasn't published any designs other than Twilight Struggle and Imperial Struggle, whereas Jason Matthews has done a fair number of other things, many of them about politics. He did Campaign Manager 2008, 1960 Making of a President, which was kind of sort of like Twilight Struggle-ish, 1989 Dawn of Freedom, which was kind of sort of like Twilight Struggle-ish, and a number of other things, including Founding Fathers, which is nothing like Twilight Struggle, but is, again, kind of about politics. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Imperial Struggle? Well, in Imperial Struggle, just before your turn turn begins, you have to take one or two things into consideration, Mark. Like, is this a war turn or a peace turn? What theaters are worth the most points this turn? What event cards do I have? And how many investment tiles are available that will let me play them? What ministry cards should I play? And will a bonus trigger my event cards? What advantage tiles do I have? And which ones can I easily get to help me? Which commodities are in demand this turn? What war tiles did I draw in, and what four wars are they in, and which one should I improve? How much debt do I have available? How many flags and or markets do I control in each of the four different theaters? Which political spaces will add to the next four wars? These are all questions that you might have to come in mind when, you, when, you, when you're about to start your turn in, in Imperial Struggle. You're making me want to play again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, here's the thing. First off, this is not a CDG. It is not a card-driven game the way Twilight Struggle was. It's not even a card-driven game the way Watergate was. This is action drafting. There are these tiles that give you action points. There are three different flavors of action points. And largely speaking, you're just going to have some number of action points over the course of the turn, some of them allowing you to play event cards. And the cards are a little superfluous. I'm not saying that they're, a, they're, they're an extraneous design element, but they don't drive the action in nearly the same way that a card-driven game does. Because as you say, only certain tiles will let you play them. Generally speaking, my experience has been that in a given action round, you'll play about four events, two per side-ish. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. And the events are nice, but they don't, they don't, they're, they're not a primary driver of the action. Despite this difference, though, and I'll just say this and then we can move on because I don't think you've played a lot of Twilight Struggle. It feels an awful lot like Twilight Struggle to me in a lot of ways because it's, as you were saying, all these, all these rhetorical questions. I don't know if in your classic impish way you were trying to imply something. And based on the look on your face, clearly you were, but we'll get to that later. You're juggling different areas of influence while slowly expanding your territory, for lack of a, of a better word. It's not a territory in the sense of a, of, a, of a war game or a troops on a map game, but it's about expanding your sphere of influence with all of these different considerations in play. And being able to do that effectively while juggling all these different fronts felt very Twilight Struggle-ish to me, at any rate. So the first thing I wanted to touch on is those event cards, like you said. And I, I, I feel the same way. They're not overpowering. And I just felt it was a very interesting trade-off because there was these investment tiles, which was I thought was an odd name. But anyway, it's the tiles that you're going to pick, and it'll tell you what kind of action you're going to take. And it'll have a main action and, and a smaller action. And there are particular ones that you have to take in order to – not only do they have to say that you can play an event card, but uh, they have to match the type of event cards you have. So if you have a diplomatic event, you have to make sure you get a investment tile that not only lets you play an event card, but its main action has to also be diplomatic. This being said, those particular tiles usually are less effective as actions. Like they'll give you less points. And I felt as though the event card would bring that up to – the the other tiles, like, you know, would sort of equal out, would, get, would make them just as powerful. And sometimes if you hit the bonus or whatever, it would make them just slightly more powerful and, and, you know, didn't throw the game way out of whack. It was just sort of that little advantage that you could sort of, you know, figure out like a little mini puzzle, you know, and said, okay, wow, cool. I really got, you know, all my cards out this turn, and, you know, and gave me the advantage this turn. As a way to balance out the quality of the investment tiles, I agree with you that the event cards did a very good job. There was this additional level that I was hoping was going to be a little bit more 
tense in terms of trade-offs that didn't really materialize in the way that it was because you talked about the bonuses. Many, if not most of the bonuses with the event cards key off of what ministry cards you have. At the start of every era, you get to pick two ministry cards for your nation. And they're kind of built-in structural governmental advantages that, that, that you might have. And they have keywords that serve purely to power up these event cards. And I was hoping that it was going to be the situation where I look at the ministry card and say, I really want this one, but it doesn't work with my ministry cards, do, uh, with my event cards rather. Do I take the better ministry card or do I power my events? In practice, I didn't find that the ministry cards were sufficiently compelling by themselves. And so mostly I just looked at my event cards and just had them do that. So in that sense, it was less like a trade-off and more like guideposting, which I suppose is okay. It kind of reduced the, the sea of noise available and gave me a, a direction. Uh, there was one possible exception, which was very neat. And that was the French Jacobite Rebellions, because the Jacobite Rebellions card doesn't key off of anything, requires significant expenditure on your part. But if you get all your ducks in a row, you get showered with points, which is nice. The other, the other interesting thing that these investment tiles do is that depending on how you draw them, because there's a giant pile of them and you're only going to draw seven. So there could be some particular actions that are in, in scarce supply. So you got to sort of figure out which ones you're going to do. And not only that, you can sort of maybe deny your opponent what they need to do. Cause you can see, oh, there's only like three or one diplomatic action. I'm going to take that before they do. And bam. Absolutely. And so there are three different kinds of action points you can generate. There are political points, which take over square spaces. There are economic points, which take over circular spaces. And then there are military points, which, broadly speaking, takes o- take over hexagonal spaces. And the interplay between those three different kinds of action points is initially overwhelming. But once you actually start playing, it's incredibly trivial. The design is very well done. The shapes are consistent. And if you have three economic points, you can just look at the map and say, okay, well, what are these spaces that I can take over? And again, juggling these different areas is very cool because most spaces will contribute. This is an oversimplification. will contribute towards two things. For example, most markets will contribute towards your theater control and will contribute towards your commodity control. Most political spaces will contribute towards your theater control and either your military effectiveness in a coming war and or a prestige space and or an advantage space. So there's usually a couple of different metrics that every space will contribute towards your success. And having to balance all those things is what I, f- I found the most compelling kind of trade-offs in terms of the resources that were available to you. Yeah, I really liked how they keep kept all the symbology the same. Because everything that has to do with wars, they were octagon spaces. The forts were octagon spaces. The ship tokens were octagon, were octagon shaped. All of the war tiles that you put on the thing were octagon. So anything, you know, had to do with war, they were all octagon shaped. So it was easy. The anything to do with conquer points were squares. Diamonds were all the diplomatic spaces and all the markets were circles. So you knew exactly what the spaces were for and what you needed to do to same thing with the, the initiative action tiles that you're taking they all had those symbols on them so you knew you know diplomatic you had diamonds so on and so forth i just thought it was nice they kept everything in a game that had so much overwhelming information off the beginning or even while you're playing it was nice to have this you know clear consistent symbology throughout the game absolutely despite that however i will point out that Despite the long development time and very much in keeping with Twilight Struggle, there are there were some production errors. Uh, there are some spaces on the map that are supposed to have mnemonics to remind you they participate in wars that are absent. There, there was an there was an entire kind of action that was omitted from the rulebook and yeah. is only present on the player. Yeah, and, we, and I, I noticed it almost right off the beginning. It's like we're going in the player and it says, "Oh, you can spend these points to get a card." You know, are you sure? You know, you didn't say that, and you like look at the wall. It's not the rule. Rule book. I have a very bad habit, and I should stop doing this especially for war games. I have a bad habit of just reading the rule book in isolation from all the other materials. And so, for example, when reading the section on how to spend military points, my mind was working in overdrive trying to remember all the different costs of things. Like, for example, it's, it's not har- hard or arbitrary, and I did internalize it before we started playing, but deploying a fleet costs one point unless there's another fleet there, in which case it costs two, unless the fleet that you're deploying came from your your naval box, in which case it costs three. And you said, how am I supposed to remember this? And I said, "Uh, I don't know. And then a second later, you looked at your player and said, oh, it's summarized right here. I really need, when learning these games, to have all the player aids in front of me so I can know what I need to remember and what I don't need to remember. But in this case, it was just flatly a publication error, so I'm not going to blame myself for that particular thing. Speaking of the wars, I like how they, they space them out. There's four wars, and they're all spaced out through six turns, and it gives you a time to you know, uh, get ready for them, you know, and space them out. And they have different tokens for each war and, and different areas of the map will con- contribute to the wars and some won't, you know, as you go through the ages, you know, some, and it's historically accurate, I'm assuming. 
<laughs> Actually, there's no such country as Spain. The War of Spanish Succession entirely made up. Oh, weird. Yeah. So the four wars, each war has four theaters of war. There's the War of Spanish Succession, War of Austrian Succession, the Seven Years' War, which is probably the conflict that I know the most about in these uh, in, in this period, and the War of American Independence, which I love the fact, by the way, no shade on the Americans, but I love it being recast as just this pissing contest between two, two great imperial powers, because for the English and the French, that is exactly what it was. I don't mean to minimize, like, absolutely, because there are tons and tons of war games about the American War of Independence that are just about the Revolutionary War. But in this context, it was very much from the French and English imperial axis. The French supported the Americans just to make the British life difficult. And so as a result, George Washington is a counter in the French counter mix. So you can lead with some, although it's historically accurate, you have these different military tiles for each war that are purely cosmetically different from each other. The, the rule book says you can use the same counter mix for each of the four wars. You're just not going to have the same historical flavor. So as a result, you can have George Washington showing up in India and <laughs> helping out the French there. But the, the rule book says you know, just imagine someone of, of so, someone of similar stature. Yeah, it's much like Quartermaster General or Twilight Struggle. Uh, not only the, do the tokens have, like you said, the war leaders on them and stuff, but the event cards and the ministry cards. ministry cards all sort of make sense and thematically sometimes make sense as well what they do to the board. And I think they did a great job there it's, as well. It's from a very high level. Because, again, we're talking about four major wars, each with four major theaters. We're talking about the entire global map of imperial uh, contestation. We're talking about 100 years. And so, obviously, it's a very, very, very high level. Nonetheless, there are hat tips to very significant events that I, I again, I, I, I know a little bit about and, and therefore appreciate. You know, Montcalm makes an appearance, which is great. You can do the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, kind of, sort of, almost, but not really, which is, which is great. It, much like your better historical war games, it made me want to read more about the period. I know nothing about the War of Austrian Succession or the War of Spanish Succession, so I read a little bit more about those, and I've been learning a little bit more about it. I, I, was, I have a note at, for the very end there, because it's, it was the opposite for me, honestly. Mm. If I have, if I've just picked up a World War One or World War Two game, it inspires me to look, up, look it up or watch videos or read about it, either a particular battle or a person. This unfortunately did did none of that for me do you think this was a design element or just the period of history or the I level think, of abstraction i think it's just the level of the the history that part of history sure. doesn't doesn't have i haven't found that one particular thing that pulls me into it yet I hear you. And if you're looking for that particular hook, I don't think a game at this level of representation is apt to do it, honestly. But in addition to all the historical hat tips, they had a whole bunch of, of counter counterfactual historical bits. Like, for example, New World Huguenots. The French have this ministry card, which is, eh, what if the French decided to send their religious dissidents over to Nouvelle France? What would have happened then? And I thought that was awesome, partially because I'm descended from Huguenots and partially because colonial practice and colonial standards of, of immigration had a huge influence on the development of our two countries and, of course, on the development of the Seven Years' War. But anyway, I, I could go down the rabbit hole of the Seven Years' War for, for a little bit, especially with the release of Hamilton on Disney Plus recently. There's the major appearance by everyone's favorite French nobleman, whose full name is Marie-Joseph-Paul-Yves Roche-Gilbert du Moitié de Lafayette. So that was that was awesome. Talks about, you know, how, how, uh, George Washington was the American Kim and, and anyway, there's lots of great history there. I loved it. Very little touches, but again, it was on a very, very high level. And if you have zero enthusiasm for the period, I wouldn't be surprised if it's going to leave you a bit cold. Maybe I'll watch an old Errol Flynn movie and maybe that will pull me back in. Did Errol Flynn make movies around this time? Yeah, all the sword fight. Yeah, it's fantastic. The victory point track, Mark. It's this really interesting tug of war. It's one of these things where it starts. It's a it's a thirty point track, and the, it starts at fifteen, and it either moves towards the French, which is trying to get it to zero, or the English, who's trying to get it to thirty. Other way around. Is that the other way around. Of course, it is because I had a fifty fifty chance of getting it right, <laughs> and I had to choose. It's one. not a big deal. One way or the other. So one we've already, side, we've one, already had 10 comments about how we got it wrong. Yeah, well, I'm sure. One side's trying to get it to, to max out. The other one's trying to get it to zero. There you go. Now you're guaranteed to be right. Exactly. And uh, and there's some mercy, sort of like what I what I call mercy victory conditions as well. If someone's like getting totally blown out, then it says, you know, if someone wins all of the wars completely, then the game ends. And the other one was if someone wins all four f theaters and all three commodity prizes. That's right. Then they also win. It. <laughs> and if that has, I, I can't, if that ever happened, man, we someone... came close to that once. Not not the wars. The wars we had a great deal of difficulty winning 
I don't think we ever saw any of the any of the the, the wars win in a blowout ever, much That's less right. all four for the same person. I think a couple times though, one of us got all four theaters and maybe one or two of the commodities. Uh, we did see sudden death victories from the from the the the, the point totals crashing out at zero or thirty. And I will say that there have been a number of reports online about the length of Imperial Struggle. A lot of people saying that it was a lot longer than Twilight Struggle. I don't think that's actually true. I think with two experienced players, and when we were getting down at a good clip, a full game going the distance, which it may or may not go the distance, is probably going to be about three hours, which is roughly what you can expect from Twilight Struggle. It's just a lot of people have played Twilight Struggle dozens and dozens of times, and now they can crack out a game in 90 minutes. Sure. And, but I, I think that Imperial Struggle could be at that level of, of speed, especially since really it's a six turn game where fundamentally all you're doing over the course of the turn is drafting four tiles and then spending the action points from them. Yeah. I just thought, I just really like the mechanism where you can sort of see how the, so it fe- gives you a feel of a tide. You know what I mean? It's like slowly working up and you're losing control and then suddenly, you know, it's game over. I thought, I thought it made me feel that way anyway. So it was pretty cool. I really liked though, given that I, I should emphasize, there are lots of ways to turn things around. You know, if the tide is turning against you geographically, you can snag an advantage tile to really try to kneecap somebody. If the war is going against you because they've snagged all the alliances, well, you can just plow a whole bunch of military resources into getting those bonus tiles out or vice versa. I really felt that I had tools in my toolbox that were available to me, and I felt that I had a certain degree of flexibility, while at the same time, just like Twilight Struggle, the geographical fronts, for lack of a better term, being relatively stodgy. The rules about daisy chaining are very strictly enforced. It's very hard to make rapid progress anywhere, except, and this is one of the areas where I think the rules could have been shaved off a bit, the rules are very consistent about how you never daisy chain. If you control a space, you can't jump more than one space away from that in a single action round, except for the ways you can. And that part was it's like, most of the rules, I'm like, this is consistent, this is clean, this is good, I can I can get behind this, this is a 30-page rule book, but everything is accessible, and and they get to, okay, well, here's the one way you can daisy chain. I'm like, uh, you lost me. <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> and this being said, much like Twilight Struggle or other game or other games, a new player would be crushed. If someone has played this game several times and is introducing a new player to this, they they have no chance whatsoever. Absolutely. But unlike Twilight Struggle, where you're where into a large part you'll be crushed because you don't know anything about the way the card decks work. Here you're just gonna be crushed because the systems are against you and the person who knows the game system is better able to make those trade offs and use their action points more effectively. With one minor exception, this is one area that I I never got comfortable with the game. When I initially played Imperial Struggle, I was really worried about the overall information presentation in terms of score. We talked about this in terms of scythe, right? Being able to eyeball a board and try to come up with some sort of heuristic about who's doing well and who's doing poorly is important to me, even if the specific details aren't always fully transparent. And I was worried, given the many different ways that you're in competition with each other in Imperial Struggle, it would be very difficult. But eyeballing who's doing well in the different commodities, easy because the commodities are all limited to a single region. Cotton is only available in India, so you can just glance at India and see how well someone's doing. Same thing with overall flag progress. It's but region by region you can glance. The wars, on the other hand, each war has four different theaters, and each theater counts different things and different areas, sometimes different sub-areas within the same region. For example, there's there will be several wars with several theaters in Europe. And you'll see on the map that there will be a visual indication, assuming it's not one of the misprints in Spain, that this space contributes towards your strength in the first war. But it won't tell you what theater. So here you are gobbling up spaces in Europe to try to protect yourself in in the war in Europe. And you'll look down to realize, oh, wait a minute, I overshot in front one and wasted a whole bunch of effort. And I barely lost in front two, despite the fact that the map is almost entirely in my color. And that part I never got comfortable with. Every time I really felt like if I wanted to play optimally, I should sit down and recalculate everyone's strength in every front at all times. But I would never be willing to play that way. Agreed. What I commented on was the fact that if, if this ever got a digital implementation and it, and it, like we just talked about with the scythe leaderboard, if you had just something you could click on, it would tell you where everyone sat at a particular time in this particular uh, instance, it would be fantastic and would make the game way more playable. And I'm surprised that the Vassal module doesn't do that, because the Vassal module for Twilight Struggle, again, the, the Vassal module for Twilight Struggle has been in development for over a dozen years. But I would love to be able to see in the Vassal module, if you look at the war map, for the war map to just say, ah, oh, well, currently England has five points of strength in this front and France has four, plus, plus or minus whatever the war- secret war tiles give you. I would love for that kind of functionality. At present, it doesn't exist. All right, we use the term handcuffed, 
And that's in, in minds of games like Risk or other territory games where you can't bust out to try to stop somebody where you feel as though you, there's nothing you can do. And I find in this, I find I feel this way in this game. Like, like you just talked about, you can't daisy chain out. So if you need to take things quickly in order to try to catch up, you can't, you can just slowly progress across. There's these other things called conflict markers, which will totally euchre you as well. They can cut off your supply lines. And once again, you're where you're back to square one and you can't move out. There's fort protection, which makes it even harder to move around. I actually think that one problem solves the other. I was worried when, again, when I was reading the rules that it was just going to be too much like a seesaw, because this is one of those areas actually where I think Jason, some of Jason Matthews' own design don't realize how brilliant Twilight Struggle is. Twilight Struggle in many ways succeeds because of one simple rule. If you control a country, it costs your opponent two influence points, not one, to put influence into that country so long as you maintain control. And that prevents it from just being, well, I'll put five points here, you put five points in the same place, okay, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's what 1960 making of a president feels like to me. It's like, I dump five points into Pennsylvania, okay, you dump four points in Pennsylvania, okay, I'll dump another six points in Pennsylvania, back and forth endlessly. And I was worried that this might be the kind of thing, because there's no similar uh, notion in imperial struggle that would give you some sort of built-up advantage. But in practice, just the way the geography works, and the fact that you have several tools at your disposal, whether it's sending in a navy, whether it's using a conflict marker, that's the way you dislodge your opponent. That's the way you turn the tide. You make use of these other resources you have available to you. And so, to my mind, I never felt handcuffed. I just felt like I had to find the right tool for the applicable occasion when the tide was turning against me. I just found it very hard to find those tools. Like, with the the action cards, right? There's only, uh, when you do the minor action part on the action cards, you only get to do one action. And the fact that you have to match them up with your cards, like for your event cards, if they weren't there, then you couldn't use them. Yeah, as I said earlier on, the, the interaction between the event cards and the ministry cards and the tiles, I felt a little too restrictive and I would have liked a little more latitude there. So in that sense, I will agree with you. In there could, yeah, you could even not even get the right investment tiles out there, like to play your event cards. It's like you could have a hand of nothing. They just, they're not, it's not there. And my last point I have is feeling of no control. Like you have no idea what actions are going to come out with. Like I just talked about the event cards until you've played the game several times, you'll have no idea what event cards are your opponent's going to throw at you. And it could throw a big curveball into your plans. Two different war tokens. Yes. So you have your general war tokens out there and then you have all these bonus war tokens. So you have no idea, you know, what kind of advantage that your opponent's going to have, you know, when you go into the wars. So it's hard to like gauge where you sit, like not even. Like, what, like we talked about having no idea, you know, where the wars are. Now there's three tokens that are going to change that even further. And then just my last point is that there's changing, changing victory points. All of these things, most of these things, like the markets and the, and diplomacy, you're going to be putting flags out on the board. And these are all going to be countered to give you victory points. But those also change every round. You have, you have no idea what's going to be worth points and what's not. And in a way, that's a good thing as well, right? Because then if someone's doing really, you know, if someone's concentrating in one market, then it's going to be, it could be worth zero the next turn and they've wasted all their time. And now you can concentrate on the other one. But I just felt so that, you know, that not knowing what's coming up and having control. I'm going to have to disagree with you. And this is why, because it's a six turn game and the elements that vary before the start of the turn Sure, you can't predict with, with perfect foreknowledge. I can't, I don't know what turn two is going to look like at the start of turn one. But by the same token, a turn gives you enough latitude. Once you see the lay of the land and you see what investment tiles are available, you look at your hand of event cards, you can try to make some plans, although you have to be flexible, for how the turn is going to look. And even if every turn were a self-contained game by itself, that would be enough of a long-term horizon, I think to justify the level of control you have. But that's not the case, because even though, yes, some of the benefits overturned, Europe may be worth three points one turn, and the next turn it's worth zero points. Absolutely, that is something that can happen. But you still have all those markers that you put out in turn one in turn two. And those markers, as I said, will not just be worth their victory point value. They'll also contribute towards the wars and the prestige value and all those other things and the, uh, your fleets that you sent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So... Some metrics shift more quickly than others, but there's still a strategic horizon whereby your sunk costs and your overall investments will benefit you. And yes, it's the case 
that you might look over and see that somebody has sunk in two special war tiles in, in the theater, and you don't know if those special tiles contribute one point of strength or three points of strength, but you know they've devoted considerable resources into the theater, and that, I think, is enough to know that either I need to counter it or shift my resources elsewhere. So I, I did not feel... I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say these things. I did not feel the sense of lack of control, and I did not feel the sense of being handcuffed. I felt that it, it did a very good balance in terms of giving you recourse, giving you flexibility, giving you tools, while at the same time not shackling you to a, you know, five-turn, 75-year strategic horizon. So all this being said, I really enjoyed Imperial Struggle. I would play it again in a heartbeat. I would never suggest playing it, but I think if you have a if you have a, a, a partner or someone you play a lot of two-player games with, this is definitely right up your alley. It's something that you can like dive deeply into, and you're going to get – the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. It's one of these games where the more you invest, the more you'll get out of it. Imperial Struggle, GMT, fantastic cover, by the way. <laughs> it actually has, has has real colors in it and everything. It was not done by Roger McGowan. It was done by somebody else. So, <laughs> I was very pleased by Imperial Struggle. I was initially concerned about the level of rules grit, but I found that it was very smooth playing. It's not a, it's not Twilight Struggle, but it doesn't try to be. It's its own beast. If you have any enthusiasm for the historical period, that is going to add to your enjoyment considerably. But I think as Waster, Walker's testimony demonstrates, you don't need to be interested in the, in the history to enjoy it purely as a game. This is a very niche product, you know, a three-ish hour, relatively dense two-player game. But I still think that this is this has the potential for the right audience to be the kind of crossover, intro war gamey kind of thing for the historically curious Euro gamer, or for the war gamer that's interested in a slightly lighter, uh, slightly quicker, very very bird's eye view of a long period of time. Yes, you're not going to be fighting out the tactical details of Brandywine. Instead, you're just going to be deploying a single counter that represents the entirety of the American Revolutionary War. But I think that there's a lot of historical flavor packed in there. And in terms of quality decision making, I was very very pleasantly surprised by Imperial Struggle. So I don't know that it's the kind of thing that's going to enter regular rotation, given given our play styles and our, our history of play. But I'm very pleased with the end result, and I think that overall, minor printing errors notwithstanding, it was very much worth the wait. 100%. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter, at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We have a Patreon. We have a Patreon. We have a Patreon. And we, we, I want to thank all our Patreon backers. Absolutely. It, this is thanks to you. You know, we can't review these games and tell people what's good and or wrong with them without uh, being able to play them. And because of you, we get to do that. We get to spread our disdain because of your gracious support. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.